All right. So let's talk about the functions of some of these things in the plasma itself. Water ultimately um, is solvent and it's also a suspending medium. A lot of things will dissolve in water. And because we have multiple things that dissolve in water, it kind of makes the best um, solvent to have as part of our blood, especially the things like the ions. Ions dissolve in water like nobody's business. Think about it. I put a teaspoon of sugar in a glass of water, it's going to dissolve. I put salt into a glass of water, it's going to dissolve. Those are things that kind of help us out when we're talking about moving things from one place to another. Even with the proteins that are big and complex, because the water is always moving and mixing, it actually makes it a good suspension medium as well. Now, the ions... The ions are involved in things like osmosis. Remember that water moves from a low to, I'm sorry, yeah, well, a low solute concentration to a high solute concentration. So it's water moving from a high water concentration to a low water concentration. Um, that actually helps us when we're talking about moving certain things across our selectively permeable membranes of our cells, it is the ions are also involved in membrane potential. Chapter nine with the muscles, chapter 11 with the neurons. We talked about membrane potential till our eyes bled, right? So membrane potential is a big part of how things move. Um, and the main thing that we're moving in the case of membrane potential are the ions. Whether we're talking about sodium moving into the cell to start an action potential or potassium moving out of the cell so that we're repolarizing the inside of our cell and making it more negative. Acid-base balance is another part of this because if you'll remember, simplest acid on the planet is a hydrogen ion and a base simplest base on the planet is also an ion. It's hydroxide, OH minus. Now don't forget, an ion is going to be a charged particle or atom. So that's what our ions are important for in our blood. Now the nutrients, vitamins. Vitamins promote enzyme activity. In the grand scheme of things, we talk about the fact that vitamins are going to be um, <clears throat> the on-off keys for a lot of the enzymes. They're coenzymes. So when we talked about enzymes way back when, one of the things that I mentioned was that enzymes are expensive. It takes a lot to make an enzyme. It costs us a lot of ATP to make an enzyme. So when we've made an enzyme, we don't just want that enzyme to um, work for us and then we're gonna take it and break it down and get rid of it. Instead, we kind of want a way that we can turn that enzyme on and a way that we can turn that enzyme off. And what we have are vitamins. Vitamins, when they're present, the enzyme works. When we take the vitamin away, it's like turning the key off on your car. It basically just sits there. It's fine. It's not getting damaged. Nothing bad is happening. But it's also not just there to work for no reason. Sorry, I just hit something on my desk. Okay, the rest of our nutrients that we have, glucose and um, proteins and lipids, for the most part, we're talking about either energy or we're talking about building blocks. Glucose, sugar, and the lipids that we are absorbing as nutrients for the most part, those are going to be broken down to make energy for our body. So we have fuel so that we can do the processes that we need to do to keep us alive. Amino acids are going to be the building blocks. So amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. They are the pieces that make up a protein. So with the amino acids, we talk about, um, well, 
I talk about Legos. Legos can be used to make a ton of different things, right? But if I've got something made out of Legos, I can take it apart and then just reuse those blocks to make something new. Amino acids are kind of the same thing. You've got 20 different amino acids, but you can use those 20 amino acids to build any protein. It's not like if I've got an, um, I don't know, an aspartic acid in this protein, I can't use that same aspartic acid in that protein. If I've got a gray Lego that I use to build a ship, it's not like I can't use that same gray Lego to build the Death Star. Okay. So with building blocks, we're talking amino acids. But both my um, sugars and fats and my um, amino acids are going to be nutrients. Regulatory substances. Enzymes. Enzymes catalyze chemical reactions. So they make reactions go faster, they make them use less energy, and they make it easier for those reactions to happen. They catalyze chemical reactions, as well as the hormones that we just spent unit one talking about, two chapters in unit one talking about. They can stimulate body functions or they can inhibit body functions. Both of these are regulatory because both of these are going to be used to regulate some function in our body. Okay, need to get water, sorry. So the two gases that we talk about the most are oxygen and carbon dioxide, right? You breathe in oxygen, you breathe out carbon dioxide. That's what everybody says. So why do we need oxygen? This is why. Oxygen is required for aerobic respiration. Aerobe means oxygen. So aerobic respiration is a type of glucose breakdown that happens in our cell's mitochondria that gives us the highest amount of ATP per glucose molecule that we can get. Pretty much one glucose gives us 36 to 38 ATP. That's like me giving you a quarter and you giving me a $20 bill. And if anybody's interested, let me know because I've got quarters. Anyway, that oxygen is kind of the key thing that we need to get that process to work. That's why we need oxygen and that's why it's in our blood. Carbon dioxide is actually a waste product of that same aerobic respiration. It can be used um, as well though as an ion, or as, I'm sorry, a buffer. Um, the bicarbonate ion is actually made from carbon dioxide. So because it's made from carbon dioxide, we can use that carbon dioxide waste product that we have as a buffer um, to help us to maintain our pH our blood's pH. Okay, and I kind of already touched on this, but nitrogen gas is going to be found in our bloodstream. It's there because 70% of our Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen gas. Within our body, it really doesn't do anything. It's just there. And it's there because you've got 70%, there's bound to be some that's going to get transferred into your blood as well. The plasma proteins I mentioned. I mentioned globulins, albumins, and fibrinogen, right? So I'm going to go with fibrinogen first because this is one of those plasma proteins that the name kind of gives it away. Fibrinogen. It functions in blood clotting. It helps to make the fibers that are involved in making clots when we start to bleed. And again, the name kind of gives it away. Albumin. <coughs> Sorry, I just choked on absolutely nothing. <coughs> Don't you hate that when you choke on your own spit? That's terrible. Anyway, albumin. Um, just to kind of give you a visual of albumin, imagine raw egg whites. That's kind of the, the texture that you find if you've got purified albumin. Um, it is partly responsible for the blood's viscosity. Viscosity is just a fancy way of saying thickness. So it is responsible for the blood's thickness. Okay. Um, it's also responsible 
partially responsible for the osmotic pressure, so the water movement, okay? It can act as a buffer, so it can help us to maintain our blood's pH, but the other thing that it does is it acts as a transport protein. So remember in the last unit, we talked about those lipid soluble hormones and them having to be contained within a transport protein. Albumin actually is a transport protein. Now the globulins, we've got three types of globulins we're gonna mention. We've got alpha globulin, beta globulin, and gamma globulin, okay? Alpha globulin, it protects um, tissues in your body via the process of inflammation. It does function as a transport protein and it'll actually convert iron two plus into iron three plus. Um, now you're probably going, uh, so iron two plus is not that easy to transport. Um, when we get it out of our red blood cells and we need to transport it for recycling, iron two plus doesn't like to go if we make it into iron three plus it makes it a little easier to transport it so that i can use it again and recycle it so alpha globulin is responsible for making that iron two plus turn into iron three plus so that it's easier to transport it in a transport protein called transferrin Trans across ferrin is ferric, which is Latin for iron. So transferrin is transporting iron. It also transports hemoglobin from damaged red blood cells. Hemoglobin is the thing that carries oxygen in our blood cells. So being able to transport it so that we can recycle um, is a really important function. Now, beta globulins, they also act as a transport protein. Um, they're involved in immunity and they prevent blood loss. So you can see just going from beta to alpha that while transporting is kind of um, similar, preventing blood loss is different. It's completely different and it's involved in immunity, well, alpha doesn't do that. Now, the last one, gamma globulins, and that symbol is just a gamma. Um, most of your antibodies in your body are going to be gamma globulins. So I'm sure everybody, especially with COVID being around, has heard about antibodies by now. When they talk about antibodies on the news, when they talk about antibodies in television shows, even sometimes, most of the time you will hear them referred to as IgGs, okay? And it's basically meaning immunogamma globulins. That's what IgGs are referring to. So when we talk about antibodies, a lot of times we talk about IgGs. Sorry. Okay. So those are the major plasma proteins in the blood. Let's talk waste products. So I said this before, but urea, uric acid, um, creatine or creatinine, and ammonia salts. All of these are byproducts of protein metabolism, basically meaning that when we break down proteins like from steak or from chicken or whatever, or we're even breaking down our own proteins because they no longer work the way that they're supposed to, these are the things that we create. These are the waste products that we create. Now, these are normally excreted in the urine. Your blood goes to your kidneys and your kidneys filter and those kidneys are taking these waste products out. That's why urine eventually starts to smell like ammonia. That's one of the reasons why cat urine smells so strongly of ammonia, because these waste products are present. Bilirubin is another waste product that we talk about. Now, remember what I said about recycling the red blood cells. 
Well, in order to recycle them, we actually have to break them down. And one of the waste products from doing that is actually going to be bilirubin. Bilirubin is um, broken down, or I'm sorry, red blood cells are broken down and bilirubin is actually excreted by the liver. It becomes part of the bile that is then excreted into your intestine to help to digest fats. And this is actually one of the things that makes your poop brown because bilirubin is a pigment, it's a color. Then finally, we have lactic acid. Lactic acid is a byproduct of anaerobic respiration. So, um, the best way for us to get energy, I mentioned this before, is through aerobic respiration using oxygen in our mitochondria. We get 36 to 38 ATP out of one glucose molecule. Fantastic. But in order for that to actually work, you have to have oxygen. That is the requirement for that to aerobic respiration, oxygen respiration. When you don't have oxygen available, let's say you've been working out really, really hard at the gym and you just keep going, eventually the stores of oxygen that you have kind of run out. And yes, I understand that you're breathing and everything, but it's not enough to go from your lungs immediately into your tissues. So what your tissues do is they switch gears and they start an aerobic respiration without oxygen respiration. Now, anaerobic respiration, remember how I said one glucose gives you 36 to 38 ATP for aerobic? Anaerobic one glucose gives you two ATP. So it's not all that great. Plus, um, the byproduct of that anaerobic respiration, that without oxygen respiration, is lactic acid. Now, I'm sure everybody here at some point has either worked out or had to um, work manually, and the next day you're like, I can't move my arms. I've done that before where you know, I can't, I can't move my arms, feel like a little Tyrannosaurus Rex, right? Okay, so the buildup of lactic acid takes a while to actually get to the bloodstream to um, get filtered out. So that soreness you feel isn't just damage to your muscles. It's also the fact that those muscles are soaking in lactic acid. I don't know about you, but if somebody were to soak me in acid, I don't think I would like it either. So once it does actually get into the bloodstream, it'll go to the liver and the liver actually has the capacity to turn it into glucose. So we can turn it into a fuel source. It's just not immediate. Okay, so let's talk formed elements. Um, remember, the formed elements are either going to be the cells or the chunks of cell. So we're going to talk a little bit about the production of the formed elements. We're going to talk about the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and finally the platelets. So we have three major classes of formed elements. We have red blood cells. Red blood cells can also be called erythrocytes. Erythro means red, cytes mean cells. Um, you can also abbreviate it RBCs. You have 700 times more red blood cells than you do white blood cells. You have 17 times more red blood cells than you do platelets, okay? Now, White blood cells, also known as leukocytes. Leuco is white, cytes is cells, so leukocytes. You can also abbreviate these WBCs for white blood cells. We have two categories of these, the granulocytes and the agranulocytes. What could possibly be the difference? Yeah, when you look under a microscope, um, when you look under a microscope, granulocytes look like they have grains in them. A granulocytes don't. So the granulocytes, we have three different types. We have basophils, we have eosinophils, and we have neutrophils. 
agranulocytes, we only have two. We have monocytes and we have lymphocytes, okay? All of these, all five of these are white blood cells. They're just different categories of white blood cells, and you'll see why in just a bit. And then we have platelets, which are called thrombocytes. This isn't a really good name for them. Um, if sites mean cells, this is like not a good way to, to describe them because really and truly platelets aren't cells. They're chunks of cells, but they aren't cells. And I'll show you that in just a minute. So hematopoiesis, also called hemopoiesis, okay? This is the creation of blood, okay? So hematopoiesis, hemopoiesis. In an embryo, okay, tissues like the yolk sac, the liver, the thymus, the spleen, the lymph nodes, and red bone marrow everywhere are responsible for hematopoiesis. They are making blood. And to be honest, in a developing embryo, you need a lot, okay? After birth, after you are born, it's usually confined um, to the red bone marrow, okay? So my liver, my thymus, my spleen, my lymph nodes, there is no yolk sac, none of that is now making blood, okay? Um, some lymphoid tissue does aid in the production of specifically lymphocytes, but it's not making just general blood anymore. In young children, toddlers, um, more babies, almost all of your bone marrow is going to be red bone marrow. Now you might say, but why? Well, the reason why is because in young children, they're still growing. And it, again, if you think about the whole aerobic respiration and being able to make fuel for your body and all of that, that's actually going to require a lot of fuel. I'm growing, I'm making more bone tissue, I'm making more muscle tissue, I'm making more skin. I, I'm, I'm growing like in size and in length and all of that. So having a lot of bone marrow, red bone marrow specifically that makes blood cells makes sense. But as adults, we don't really have that much. It's confined to our ribs, to our sternum, to our vertebra, to our pelvis, our proximal femur, and our proximal humerus. So where the ball is for the ball and socket joint at your hip, that's the proximal end. It's the one closest to your torso. The ball and socket for your shoulder, that's the proximal end because it's the closest to your torso. Anywhere else that we had, previously had red bone marrow, is now going to be replaced by yellow bone marrow. Now you might say, okay, why? Why did that happen? Well, think about it. Once you're an adult, are you growing anymore? No, we kind of know exactly how much energy we need to run this body that is this size. So I don't necessarily need all of this extra bone marrow making extra blood cells because I need extra oxygen because I'm growing. Nah, don't need that anymore. 